Hello there, darling. Welcome to Roots and Refuge. We are not at the farm currently. We are in my office where I've come to have a chat with you. I am doing a video today that is different, I think, than any video I've ever done. I've probably kind of gone here into the realm of opinion, but not ever on purpose like this. Sometimes I end up talking about something in a vlog, I end up really sharing my opinion, maybe get a little fired up, but never sat down to do a video for the purpose of reacting or sharing my thoughts on something that may be controversial. So to preface, if this is your introduction to my channel, my name is Jess. I share my experience growing food, my life on a small farm, gardening and homesteading, taking care of animals, cooking that food, sharing it, as well as just trying to live kind of better in relationship with the people that I'm in relationship with and the earth. I am by nature pretty non-confrontational. That is because I am, by choice, really not reactive. Just not a reactive person. And I sort of have an, a maddeningly laid back uh, approach to life in general. If you are a reactive person, I just kind of usually am like, nah, it'll all come out on wash day. I don't typically get really emotionally heightened over things that do not directly and immediately affect me. And I think that's because I came, I became a mom when I was 19 and I've spent the last 20 years of my life raising children and staying so busy that I don't really have the emotional capacity to have huge reactions to things that do not immediately affect me. So sometimes topics will come up in like the gardening community and in the online spheres that I am present in and I will hear conversation, I will see people get really heated. Um, I spent a good bit of time today moderating a thread on my Facebook group that actually spurred off one of the topics that I'm gonna talk about because people got really heated. People got really re reactive as, as one does on the internet. And I had multiple people tagging me saying, Jess, what are your thoughts on this? I kind of started thinking about it. I'd read the article in question as well as another article that came out, got a huge response in the gardening community a couple weeks ago that I had been tagged in a ton. And I thought, why don't I share my thoughts on this? You may not agree with me. I'm completely okay with that. I will not argue with you if you don't agree with me and you wanna like go toe to toe. It's gonna, I mean, literally, you should go argue with a rock in your yard. You will get a greater response. Like I just have absolutely zero desire to argue opinions. I think it is the most futile thing that people do, um, aggressively arguing their opinion. If we could listen to other people's opinions with an open mind and an open heart, we would become richer for it. But being like just ready to fight with those that don't agree with you, it's just, it just doesn't win anybody over. It doesn't work. It's better, I think, if you feel a strong opinion to live by it and live according to it and therefore you can produce fruit based on what you're convicted on. And whenever you are fruitful in your convictions, you win people over. I don't know exactly. Like I can theorize, I can tell you, oh, I can see these problems, but I can also see this. A lot of times for me, I'm just not quick to draw a really strong conclusion or opinion. Give it a little time. And sometimes, yeah, I mean, I give it some time and then I'm like, okay, now I have a very clear opinion about this. But regarding the two articles that have caused such a stir in the gardening community in the last couple of weeks, I have some thoughts, <laughs> but I can't give you a definitive, this is exactly what's gonna happen because I can't I can't tell you what, how the future is gonna play out. So the two articles I'm talking about, there is an article that was released by NPR talking about the first genetically modified seed, like vegetable seed, to be marketed to home gardeners. This is a brand new thing. It's a purple tomato, which I will put a link to this article down below, but it's a richly purple tomato that has purple flesh and it was created by splicing Snapdragon genetics into a tomato and creating this bioengineered tomato. Now, the second article is about the carbon footprint of home gardens is more damaging than commercial agriculture. We'll get to that next. So back to the, the purple tomato. The reason this is a big deal 
is because to this point, and if you watch videos that I have created as recently as two or three weeks ago, talking about seed buying, I stated accurately two or three weeks ago um, that GMO crops are not available at a consumer level, which prior to this release was a true statement. Prior to this release, if you were going to go into any place or go into any online store or purchase seeds from another home gardener that was saving seeds, you are not going to get a GMO seed. Now, when we are looking at genetic modification, bioengineering, this is a really hot topic. People have a lot of opinions. I have heard out both sides. Some people are of the mind to just completely, absolutely black and white, no GMOs, no matter what. Some people argue that GMOs bring a lot of benefit as far as being able to create greater production and efficiency of producing food. And oftentimes I hear the arguments about how, you know, the science and the technology of genetic modification has helped solve a lot of the issues and could potentially, while being played out further, provide a lot more resources for people around the world and especially people who don't live in places where food really readily grows. So you, so you could grow more in some regions and put the food over where it's needed. I feel like it's really hard to succinctly talk about the GMO issue at a base level because anywhere that you have corporate greed, it's not black and white. You can make the argument, oh, GMOs are helping people, but they're also making some people insanely rich. And while I will concede that perhaps there is benefit in creating GMOs, I will not agree that how it is being done right now is for the benefit of people. It's just, I cannot look at the overall of the situation and be like, yeah, this is a humanitarian effort. This is for the benefit of people at large. I think that's being used as a reason uh, why it should be acceptable, why it should be celebrated. But I tend to err in the no GMO at all camp. Like I don't buy genetically modified food. Um, I am, I mean, obviously I have not been using any genetically modified seeds in my garden because they up to this point have not been available to on a consumer level. And the reason why I take a black and white approach is because where there's so much gray, and there's not full disclosure, things are being emotionally charged as in, you know, you would have people starve, you would have people struggle, you would have like, as if saying no to the corporate greed makes you a bad person because you're somehow taking food away from somebody who needs it. When things get like that, when they get muddy like that, I'm out. If there can't be enough transparency in an issue for me to have the facts, both positive and negative, I just, I'm out. That's just always been my approach. My family will still go out to eat at restaurants. We don't make a massive habit of it. It's not something we do all the time, but we will do it. If you are eating in a restaurant, you're likely consuming something that was genetically modified. So when I say I'm pretty black and white about it, I'm not entirely black and white about it. Like obviously I'm still making some exception. The thing is, is it's such a monster to like actually try to sort out and unmuddy. It strikes up all this controversy. Now, a lot of people, don't know why they don't want to do GMOs. They just hear other people talking about it and they're like, oh, that's bad, I don't want to do it. My concern with some genetic modification is that there are some things that are happening that are very alarming. Um, for instance, there are crops that are subsidized by the government. I heard um, Will Harris of White, White Oak Pastures say a phrase that really I liked. He said they're artificially cheap. Corn is a good example, sugar beets, um, sunflower, that's another big GMO crop, soy. Like these are some of like the big GMO crops in the United States right now. And the government is subsidizing these crops so farmers are actually getting paid really by the government to grow them. They're not actually getting paid by selling the crop. So they're receiving money and I'm way oversimplifying this but that's more or less the gist of it. Which means they're then motivated to grow this crop versus growing a crop that maybe isn't GMO and because the government isn't paying for that one. So 
the farmers, which I'm not knocking the farmers who do this, a lot of these people are in a position that they don't have another choice. I mean, they have to do this to keep their head above water, to keep their family afloat. Take the subsidies, they grow what they're told to grow, they sell it where they're told to sell it. It is artificially cheap. And so what has happened was, let's say corn, is that this crop is being grown in such abundance, grown by monoculture, that is really, really damaging to the earth, the way that it's being grown. It's not good for soil, it's not good for the environment, it's not good for the wildlife, it's just, it's not sustainable. But because the farmers, they can't really make it growing the other stuff, they have to take the subsidies, they have to do this, and now we have all this corn We've got to figure out what to do with it. And so then what ends up happening and what has happened, corn syrup gets put in everything. And so you and I go to the grocery store and we go, oh man, this looks really good. You know, it looks like it may be healthy. It's a, it's applesauce. I'm going to buy this applesauce for my child. You turn it over and the number one ingredient in it isn't even apples. It's corn syrup. And so here we are consuming the excess of the subsidized crop because it is being grown in such abundance and it's not good for us, it's not healthy for us. That's why you have to pay three times as much for the organic applesauce or the non-GMO applesauce is because you're buying an applesauce that doesn't have corn syrup in it and it costs a whole lot more because that corn syrup applesauce is artificially cheap. It's able to be sold to you not because that's actually how much it costs to produce applesauce, it's because that corn is artificially cheap because it was subsidized. So here's the alarming thing, a lot of these GMO crops like the corn, the soy, and the sugar beets there are crops and GMO seeds that have been developed through gene splicing and technology to that those plants can be grown withstanding Roundup being sprayed on them. So if you get Roundup and you go take it and you spray it all over your yard, so they're gonna kill what it lands on. But if you splice in the resistance into the genetics of a plant and you grow a field full of corn, you can go up and you can spray all the poison out on that field and it's gonna kill everything it touches except for the corn because the corn was genetically modified to be able to live through the Roundup. The problem with that is if a poison will kill any plant or insect it touches, but the corn is genetically modified to withstand it, but then we eat the corn, we're not genetically modified to withstand it. We're as organic as the bugs and the plants that it killed. So obviously that could be leading to a lot of issues. Now is all genetic modification bad? No. Is it, is it terribly dangerous for them to splice snapdragon genes into a tomato in order to change the color? I don't think so. That's probably not going to be like detrimental to eat. And I'm assuming that. I mean, obviously like withstanding poison so we can then eat the, the modified corn that withstood the poison. Like, okay, we could be like, yeah, I don't wanna eat that. Like, that's not great, that's not good. Well, it's in a lot of our stuff, you know? I mean, it's in the corn syrup that's in a lot of the things that we're buying, which is what makes shopping, trying to avoid GMOs really kind of important, but also, difficult because at this point you have to pay a premium to get the food that doesn't have that stuff in it. It's become inaccessible to the average person to really actually avoid GMOs because the whole aisle of cereal, the cheap cereal, has got GMO ingredients and so then you go to the cereal that doesn't and it's now seven dollars a box which is crazy, which is why I think it's really important right now that we start learning to cook from scratch so we can actually source quality ingredients and not eat poisoned corn. Now with the Snapdragon tomato, I could say on one hand, well that's not natural and I don't wanna eat that. I am kind of of the mind of like, if it's not naturally occurring, I'm not super into it. I am, I'm really, conservative when it comes to pharmaceuticals. I have some health issues in my bladder and some different things that I deal with and I've shared extensively about it and like it got to the point with the doctor that they started talking about doing some like implanting some technology. I was like let's pump the brakes and see what we can do naturally. I'm not going to be quick to put something foreign in my body. As a person who has grown up with a lot of health issues and has always had to be very hyper aware about what I consume, it's just created an awareness in me. So I can see how some people are like, I'm not gonna eat that tomato because it's not naturally occurring. However, 
I also see the argument of people being like, so much of what we eat is because of technologies and breeding and all that. And it's true. I mean, a lot of the hybrids that we currently use are from the interference of men. It is from selective breeding. It is from intentionally creating an end product. But there is a difference between selective breeding to create something new and genetic splicing to create something new. One, though it would have been very unlikely for very, you know, intentional selective breeding to have happened in the wild without the interference of man, it could have. Whereas the other could not have because those plants are from different genomes and therefore they could not have crossed. So I, I kind of see both sides of that argument. I think that like from common sense, you could probably say, eh, it's probably not gonna have the negative effect that obviously like the poison corn is gonna have. However, the big issue that I have here and the thing that makes me go like, mm, I don't think this is great. We'll see, I'm not gonna be reactive. But people like me now, can no longer honestly say to the new gardener, hey, don't worry about GMO seeds. They're not available to the consumer. I can't say that anymore. I'll never be able to say that again. Because of this Snapdragon tomato, that cannot be made as a blanket statement. And that muddies the waters. And it muddies the waters in an area where there is corporate greed involved. And anywhere you've got people that are building massive amounts of wealth on the ignorance of consumers, you have a potential for a really big problem. Now one tomato, one variety of a plant is not ultimately going to make a difference. This one thing, the issue is, is this the introduction of a big thing that is actually going to change the face of home gardening. And I would say that there's a very good chance with the introduction of GMOs on a consumer level that yes, this is the very first bit of a big thing that could ultimately bring a lot of change to home gardening, which just like anything else <laughs> that is being introduced in our culture right now that is new and potentially brings a lot of change, we just have to use wisdom and have like just discernment in what we're looking at, what we're choosing. And it is really hard. It is hard to be a consumer in a time where there is so much greed happening. It's hard. Um, we are advertised to so more than any other time of history we are being advertised to because we have these screens in our pockets we are taking in so much media all the time i just want you to like just go about your day tomorrow and take note how many advertisements you see just take note of it like listening to a podcast watch you know scrolling through media any sort of social media platform driving down the road the radio's on there's billboards there's you know you sit down there's a newspaper everywhere you look there are advertisements it's almost difficult to get away from it at this point so i think about like i have a kindle that i read a lot of books on and it has advertisements on it and i i chose that i could have paid more to get the kindle that didn't have advertisements on it. Ultimately, what we do is we trade our attention span to be advertised to. I mean, this is my job. I make content, the way I get paid is I make content, I basically am contracted by YouTube to make content. So YouTube broadcasts my content and ads come up on the content and YouTube splits that money with me essentially. And that means if I make really great content, more people watch it, YouTube and I make more money. You don't have to pay out of your pocket a dollar to watch my content. You can watch it for free of money charge. However, you are paying for it with consuming the advertising. That's how, that is a currency that is 100% happening and it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing. I think it can be extremely detrimental if you're not aware of it. If you are not aware of your engagement with the advertisements that you are being fed, you will just mindlessly consume. They've literally nailed down analytics that they know what they want, they, what you want. Here's, a, here's something crazy I noticed today. I'm scrolling through uh, Facebook and these ads keep popping up. And I looked at one and I was like, man, that looks like a, it was a sweater. I was like, Daniel would love that sweater, my friend Daniel. 
looks just like him. And then I scroll down a little bit longer, and then this hat pops up. It's got a feather, and it looks awful lot like the hat that Daniel wears. And I'm like, that's weird. Scroll down again, and then it's like camping gear. Like, and, and I mean, these are not things that are like commonly advertised to me. Well, Daniel's birthday's in two weeks. And this algorithm, you can actually get into the back end of Facebook and actually see the information that they have gathered about you if you go through, and you have to go all through the menus and go through advertisements and all that stuff. And it literally shows close relationships that you're in. And I spend a lot of time around Daniel. He works at our roastery. I go by there regularly. Our phones are often nearby each other. We communicate regularly through our phones. And so that algorithm knows that I am in a close relationship with someone whose birthday is in two weeks. And therefore they're showing me multiple advertisements of things. There is so much information being collected on our day-to-day -day activity, which you know, on one hand, it provides us a lot of convenience. On one hand, I could sit here and look at things that Daniel's been looking at wishing for and buy him a great gift. So we might say, okay, I trade off that sort of information in order to be able to have that convenience. But if I'm not aware of it, then I won't engage with that with the proper level of maybe self-protection. I don't know exactly how to say it. I just think being aware of it is really important. With the GMO, issue being brought into the seed buying world, it's going to be more important than ever that we as consumers are very aware of what we're purchasing, who we're purchasing it from. We're going to have to ask a lot of questions. I have stated repeatedly that I think it's great to grow seeds that whatever seeds you can get. Hybrid, heirloom, organic, not, you know, from a small business or from the big box store, whatever seeds you can get, I think it's great to grow a garden no matter what. And I'm going to stand by that. However, I have always said I prefer to spend my dollars with seed companies that are run by individuals who are pouring a lot into the gardening community. And I think that more than ever, if this issue is being introduced into the home gardening world and the seed buying world, it will be more important than ever to be very aware of who you are buying seeds from and knowing what they stand for. And if you are going to buy seeds from anywhere outside of like a place that's already made a pledge to keep their seed selection GMO free, you're just gonna need to be really aware. Because while the Snapdragon splicing seems to be fairly harmless, that's not to say that three years from now, because this introduced this issue and people are going, oh, that's cool, that's beautiful. Well, what if the next introduction is, oh, this one's really disease resistant? because of GMO splicing. Well, you know, that can get a little hairier. Well, well, then what if the next one is, hey, you can spray this chemical in your garden and it will withstand it because of GMO splicing. And so I could see that definitely being a slippery slope. And while I'm not gonna like henny penny on this and be like, the sky is falling, I, I'm, again, I'm not really reactive. I'm just kind of like, hmm, we'll see where this goes. But like many other things that are happening in the world today, you just need to be aware. I've mentioned that with AI. Um, do I think that everything to do with AI is all bad and I want to demonize it? I don't think it is. I think that it could be a useful tool potentially, but I see a lot of potential for issues and I already see a lot of the degradation of the integrity of art and poetry and music and screenwriting really being damaged. And do we want to live in a world where all of the things that spark our creativity and our joy and the beautiful things and all of this were created out of computer programming rather than the human mind? No. Unfortunately, these aren't black and white issues. It's not as simple that we as the average person gets to be like, AI, no way, get rid of that. We are consuming it already. If you Google anything already, you'll have a little blurb come up at the top and tell you something, and that was AI generated. If you go look at an Amazon review, it's gonna give you some information at the top that basically that AI went through all those reviews and it'll give you the summary of it. AI is already in so many places, and in some places, it is convenient. I appreciate a review. I appreciate not having to read through all of them. But on the other hand, it could be a slippery slope. I think that there are technologies that are currently being introduced to us that's kind of like the wild, wild west. You know, I look back at when Apple iPhones came out, 2007, 
changed everything. I watched, I rewatched the Gilmore Girls series a couple years ago and it felt like a stinking time capsule because they're running in the door to catch the phone because they didn't have cell phones. All these scenes of people in public places, they're not all like this. I am never going to be the kind of person that sits around and is like, kids these days, you know, like, I definitely see some issues, but I believe firmly that my children's generation has so much hope and so much good and so much that they are going to bring to the table that's wonderful because of the world that they lived, they grew up in. I believe that they are born for such a time as this. I don't think it's an accident that these kids were raised in this generation and in this technology. As a parent raising a child, child in this current culture, I've had to be extremely intentional that my children don't just fall to the devices of being completely addicted to screens. You know, trying to guide them and teach them communication and teach them how to navigate the world outside of their the phone. With all these issues, with augmented reality, with GMO seeds, with AI, with all of these things being introduced, again, I just feel like the most important thing is that you do not mindlessly consume. That you do not mindlessly just be like, oh, it must be fine because somebody else said it was fine. That you take the responsibility of looking at things and say, what does this mean for me? What does this look like? Do I want to take part in this? I like to think when I look at GMO seeds. I like to think, huh, well, this seems pretty harmless, but what could this, what could come in on the coattails of this? If there is an obvious progression imminent I don't want to support the first step if I look at something and go well that's harmless but I can see what could potentially come after that I'm just gonna opt out of the whole thing together as I said when things get muddy I have a tendency to want to stay on dry ground I was actually pondering this lately because I did some videos over on my cooking channel about um, canning and there are some really strong opinions on either side of canning as far as being really lax um, in canning practices versus being very very strict on following the USDA's rules I find myself between those camps therefore you know kind of kicking the hornet's nest in both of them. But I, I, I was thinking about this and I'm like, why can't I take a strong side on these things? Like, what is it in me? The truth is I've always been a somewhat anxious person. Like, cautious. I like to know what the rules are. I mostly like following rules. I feel pretty safe in that. Um, especially if it seems to be rules that make sense to me. I can stay right in there. But there is also this part inside of me that is absolutely belligerent whenever somebody tells me to do something that doesn't make sense to me. It's weird because I'm the most rebellious rule follower you will ever meet. Like, I, it, on one hand, like, if the rule makes sense, I'm right there, baby. I'll fight for it. I'll stand for it. Like, if the rule makes sense to me. If it doesn't, like, I will be the greatest opposition you ever hear. I have a really hard time with unwarranted and abused authority that's what it is but I'm also kind of anxious so I feel really safe when I know what the safe boundaries are and I it puts me in this weird conflict sometimes that like yeah I want to follow the rules but then whenever people start like freaking out I had I had multiple messages one was really scathing that someone sent me because I did a canning video and I used a metal knife to get the bubbles out of my jar. And people are like, you shouldn't use metal. And some people were really kind about it. But on the other hand, I'm like, I'm not a caveman. I'm not like slamming the metal knife into the jar. I'm gently doing it. And you know what's gonna happen when we open this jar? We're gonna toss in the sink. My teenagers are gonna wash it. If you think that's gonna be a gentle experience, it's not. And then after that jar is washed, I'm gonna can in it again. So the idea like, don't use a metal knife right here. You must use plastic makes no sense to me. So if a rule makes sense, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to feel thankful for it. I'll feel all warm and fuzzy and safe and it's going to ease my anxiety. If it makes no sense, like get out of my way. So with that being said, there's another topic that has come up in the gardening world. This was I think it was originally published in the UK and then it got shared everywhere. So I pulled it up. The first one that comes up is the Yahoo News homepage, um, Forbes, like a lot of like big media platforms shared this study that apparently the University of Michigan did a study and decided that homegrown food creates five times greater carbon emissions than those grown conventionally. And I read the article through 
slightly heightened blood pressure and trying not to roll my eyes out of the back of my head. I've yet to hear from a human who was willing to agree with this article. So I will say that. I've yet to hear anybody stand up and be like, well, simmer down with the home growing the food because we gotta save the earth. I haven't heard anybody, an actual person say that. I've seen a lot of it on main media platforms, but all the humans I am hearing from are thinking that this is as crazy as I think that it is. The studies that are reported are relatively vague. So the emphasis is being put on the structure of gardens. It is specifically saying that raised beds are causing more issues. And it goes on to say that it's not the actual gardening that is causing the higher carbon emissions. It's the construction of structures like pathways, raised beds, garden sheds, plumbing whatever. It goes on to talk about hydroponics. It goes on to talk about greenhouses and different things like that. And it's basically saying homegrown systems are creating five times more carbon emissions than commercially grown agriculture. There's a really good documentary that came out a handful of years ago. It's called Kiss the Ground. And it shows what happens <laughs> with modern agriculture the way that it's currently grown with tillage and um, the extreme use of chemical pesticides, fertilizers, things like genetically modified crops which make using chemical pesticides and fertilizers more prevalent and more acceptable and more necessary. It's a cycle, you know, when you blast the soil with something that kills all the life in the soil, you can't expect plants to grow there the next year, so you've got to blast it again. It's an extremely uh, dependent cycle, which, by the way, over the course of the last four years since COVID, the cost of those inputs has gone up significantly, and the agriculture community is so dependent on them because of the effort that it would take to switch to more regenerative practices they're kind of stuck, you know, where they kind of have to stay there to maintain status quo. I am obviously not a scientist. Um, if somebody wanted to have an argument over, you know, I, I look at this article and it's like PhD so-and-so says this and it's all of the qualifications being listed. All of us average Joes are going to read and go, well, They've got a PhD. Oh, they have the study. And I do believe whenever something like this is presented, the idea is people who know more than you have, have come to this conclusion. And I'm just going to have to say that when it comes to things like this, I'm just a really big believer in common sense. Common sense says that home gardening was the way of life until the 1920s when people started shipping food. That was the first time in history that food started being shipped to the level that it has been in modern years and it has obviously increased since then to now um we just don't think anything of the fact that we walk in the grocery store and almost the entirety of the food that is available to us was grown in somewhere far away from here. It was grown, it was shipped, it was shipped to a processing house where it was processed, created something else, wrapped in plastic, shipped somewhere else, shipped somewhere else, shipped to us, and then we go to the grocery store, we buy it, and we take it home. That's really not normal. I, 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 don't, I, I don't know exactly how to say that. Like, that's just really not normal. It's weird. Uh, 120 years ago, if you got an orange in your stocking on Christmas morning, it was a really big deal because that was the only orange you ate all year long, unless, of course, you lived in a place that tropical fruit grew. Um, I remember being a kid, my mother always put oranges in our stockings, and I was like, Mom, why are you doing this? And I would take the orange and I would put it back on the table with all the other oranges that were in the bowl because we had oranges on our table year-round in Arkansas because that's, you know, they were at the grocery store. We got them. But my mom always had an orange in her stocking, and while they probably did eat oranges outside of Christmas, it probably wasn't something they ate all the time. It was probably more expensive. But when my grandparents were children in the 1920s, 100 years ago, they got that orange and it was the only one they ate all year because people didn't ship food like that. So 100 years is not very long, and the massive difference in how we're doing food now versus 100 years ago is insane. Again, with wisdom and discernment as a consumer, we have to look at the rates of obesity and heart disease and cancer and all of the things that have skyrocketed over the last 50 years. And we have to make the connections of like, hey, why is this happening? Like why, we have to be willing to ask those questions. We have to be willing to be 
wise consumers that are using discernment, that are not just saying, oh, this is available to me, therefore it must be okay. And when we have something that's being presented that demonizes home gardening, home growing food is one of the last freedoms we have available to us where we can fully create something within our home that we do not have to be dependent on an outside input. All the other things that we consume, we are likely dependent on an outside input. But with home gardening, you can still get seeds one time from a friend, from a store, wherever. You can plant those. You can maintain your soil. It's going to take effort. It's going to take intentionality. You can grow food. You can save seeds and potentially never have to buy seeds again and continually produce and be a creator instead of a consumer. That is a really big deal. Okay. You don't have to pay taxes on the food that comes out of your garden. You don't have to drive to the store to get it. If there's a rush on the grocery store, the food is still going to come out of your garden. And if you are thinking sustainably and you're creating other systems to feed into your garden, like keeping chickens and having manure, having a worm farm so that you have fertilizer. If you were thinking of other systems to continually close the loop on your property that you could continue to produce food that you do not have to be dependent on anybody else to get, like that's one of the very few places that we still have that we can really be that local and that self-sufficient. It, it, in most places, communities have broken down to the place that like right now, if I need services, I have to travel further than 10 minutes away from my home. I have to drive an hour into the city. I have to order things online because they're not available locally. And options get continually taken away. And with the introduction of conveniences, we lose skills. For instance, how many people don't know how to bake bread? I made a video, if you want to learn how to bake bread, I'll put a link to it. I think that it's freedom. Now you're still going to have to get your flour from somewhere. You're still going to have to get your yeast from somewhere. So it's not full self-sufficiency, but if you know how to bake bread, you don't have to pay somebody else to bake your bread for you. That's all you're doing when you're going to a grocery store. You go to the grocery store, you buy a loaf of bread, you pay four or five dollars for it. You are paying somebody else to bake your bread for you. If you break it down to what's in that bread, you are in just the ingredients. That bread has all kinds of additives. It's got all kinds of stuff, likely has bioengineered ingredients, unless you're buying the really expensive bread that doesn't. But ultimately, you're paying somebody else to do it for you. You're paying for convenience. So when we come back and say, I don't want to be dependent on other things. I want to be dependent on myself as much as possible. It challenges us where we don't have skills. It challenges us where we don't have resources and systems set up. And if we're willing to face that head on, we can create re resources and systems. We can grow skills. But the home garden is one of the few places where an average person could still be a creator and create a lot of self-sufficiency. Now, I will say the article that is talking about this did go on to say that like home gardeners should focus on crops that create more carbon in conventional growing practices than they do at home. So they were saying that they, on average it takes 0.17 kilograms of CO2 to grow urban tomatoes versus the 0.27 in a conventional farm, which would use an energy intensive greenhouse. Um, and so it's saying, well, focus on these things that don't create as much. Um, I, I feel like this is really isolating a lot of the other factors that go into growing. Like it's, it's, it's really comparing apples to oranges because again, with that homegrown food, I'm not having to travel anywhere for that food. That fat food is not having to travel anywhere to get to me. And then you add on to practices like mulching, uh, like composting, like feeding your garden organically, like not using chemicals, like not using those things. Like I, the practices matter. And so you, I don't think that you can blanket home gardening and then say, oh, on average it's creating this, this much X, Y, Z. I, I just don't think that that study could be effectively looking at what home gardening is actually doing. Now, again, they're using the terms urban gardening in a lot of places, which 
again, they're referencing structures, they're referencing energy inputs and different things that I just do not feel like can be blanket applied across the home gardening network. My my baseline, like if you say, hey, what's your reaction to this? I mean, my honest reaction is I'm gonna expand my garden. Like if that kind of stuff is getting published, that makes me wanna garden more. Again, I told you guys, I am the person that when a rule is presented to me that makes no cotton picking sense, I'm just like, mm, how about no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna do the exact opposite of that. This isn't a rule, it's being presented as a study, it's being presented as fact, but I don't buy it. I'm gonna keep telling people to garden. I'm gonna keep teaching people how to build raised beds. Above all, in every place in your life where you can be a creator instead of a consumer, do that because that is your freedom. That is your power. That is your resources. I think about just going to the store and buying food. And I think about the gas that I have to pay to go to the store to buy the food, the wear and tear on my vehicle, the fact that the vehicle I have to pay taxes on, um, I have to pay for any maintenance on that vehicle, I have to pay taxes on that. I have to pay the gas, I have to pay the taxes on the gas, and then I get to the store, I buy the food, obviously paying taxes on that. Not only am I paying taxes on the food that I buy, I actually pay taxes on the money that I use to buy the food. And in my case, because I am a business owner, I pay taxes to pay myself the money to buy the food. It's wild just how much of every dollar that comes through my hands gets little bits taken out of it. And with that being the case, anything that I can create on my home that I am the full owner of from beginning to end, that it doesn't have to change any hands, that has so much greater value. And whenever you bring in the what if scenarios, which I kind of live there in my mind a lot of the time, like for instance, like when COVID happened and everywhere I was going had a two package limit on any meat and of course anytime I went in a grocery store all the family packs which were the larger packs of meats were sold out because all the people who were trying to buy meat for their family and they could only buy two packages they're buying the biggest packages they can so all that's available is one pound packages of meat I have five sons like two pounds of meat is nothing like that is a drop in the hat and it did not directly affect me because we were growing our own food we were homesteading and prior to COVID we had put lots of chickens and a couple of hogs in the freezer. So we were able to depend on ourselves rather than depending on the store. But it was very uh, eye-opening to me to go, man, how much more valuable is the food that's in my freezer now beyond what I can look at that it cost me to create? How much more valuable is it to me now because I have access to it? How much value does that access have? Here in this place, I am able to enjoy being a creator rather than simply being a consumer and therefore I have freedom and power and choice. Whereas otherwise, if I were only consuming, I would not have freedom and power and choice. I would be at the mercy of what is offered to me. So anytime topics get brought up, so, and this kind of goes hand in hand, you know, we're talking about the idea of potential demonization of home gardening which if that were supported by enough people when i say okay let's look at something that may seem harmless enough and let's see what could be riding in on the coattails of that if that idea were heralded by enough people that it could get power well how much further behind that is regulation of home gardening how much further behind that is limitation of choice of home gardening how much further behind that are you going to get taxed for however many raised beds you have or fined for different things like that and so i could definitely see a direct link that makes people go whoa sound the alarms this idea is being presented is the idea in itself damaging you know, like, can it actually do anything? No, but if enough people got behind it, it could potentially have the power to usher in another idea that could be very damaging. The idea of that, plus the idea of the introduction of GMOs into this, which really muddies the waters. My, my hot take on that, my humble opinion for what it's worth is grow a dang garden. Like, right now, wise up. <laughs> know what it is that you are seeing being presented, don't freak out. If my reaction to something like that is to plant more tomatoes, build a few more beds, create a little bit more, become a little less dependent, and then nothing happens. If people just like the purple tomatoes and then that's it, end of story, and if people just kind of shrug off that story and nothing else happens, if all I did in reaction to that was grow more food, 
What's the harm in that? Now, if I want to go tear down everybody that I can on the internet and like completely emotionally exhaust myself and storm the gates of hell with a squirt pistol, like if I am at the place of being like, oh, I'm going to fight the world because of these things, like I'm probably going to spin out. It's futility. Like don't do that. Allow your reactions to be something actively empowering, like grow, <laughs> grow a garden. <laughs> And I know that I present that as an as a solution to a lot of things. And I've even had people be like, Jess, it's not that much of a solution. Maybe not, but it's definitely not detrimental. It is definitely not detrimental to have food growing at your house, to have some chickens, to raise some meat animals, to get some dairy animals, to expand it to whatever your capacity is. Not everybody's going to have the capacity to, to expand it to that point. But it's it, it's freedom. It's choice. It's options. And when things like that are being presented, and there have been many in history that have been presenting that fell flat, they were nothing. My reaction is, I'm, I'm going to continue to be a creator. I'm going to continue to grow food, and I am 100% going to continue to encourage other people to do that. And my hope as, as an eternal optimist is that the, the worst case scenario is we grow old eating homegrown tomatoes and uh, living in the peace of our gardens barefoot in the soil and we live happily ever after. I'll take that, you know. If those ideas of the muddy waters of home gardening, potential regulations, if all of those things were to mature into much more serious issues, I think that I will be glad at that point that I expanded now. I think that I would be glad at that point that I recognized those issues and, and planned accordingly for what could be riding on the coattails of them. So those are my thoughts. That's my hot takes. You don't have to agree with me. I would like to know if you like this kind of thing. <laughs> Oh, no, that doesn't necessarily mean I'll do it again. I mean, really, I'm about to start seed starting, and I'll probably be mostly just busy teaching everybody how to grow more food. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today and all the days you do. I bless you. Until next time.